Hello, everyone. My name is Gabrielle Critchlow. I'm from a step ahead to step ahead tutoring services. Welcome to the third episode of Hot Topics, where we talk real talk about things that are happening in education, employment, mental health, social services, or anything else steamy. So we have a repeat hot topic today. Our repeat hot topic is life as a parent. So I have a guest with me who's going to help me out with this topic. Her name is Natifa Lewis. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. So let me tell you a little bit about her. Nathifa is a technology and education professional with over 20 years of experience in both fields. She is also a mom of three and was recently elected as the secretary of the Community Education District 28 in Southeast Queens. Additionally, she is a Girl Scout Troop, Girl Scout Troop co-leader and is also a member of various community-based organizations, including a moderator of the Black Career and Employment Opportunities Facebook group. So that's Black spelled B-L-A-Q-U-E, which is, and along with other subgroups of the Black Resource Network. She is also the moderator of the Grenada, Grenada Cultural Festival group and the Quake USA Cultural Organization. So Ms. Nathifa, welcome to Hot Topics today. Thank you, Gabrielle. It's awesome. a pleasure being here. It was a mouthful that I said there. <laughs> you have a lot going on. All right, so let's jump right into it. So you have an, an interesting story about um, life as a parent. So do you mind uh, telling us about how things are going for you as a mom, especially in this day and age? Um, well, so as Gabrielle mentioned, I am a mom of three. I have a son who is 14 and um, twin daughters who are 10. So I am just exiting the elementary stage, um, going into middle school and I have a high schooler. Um, in terms of my journey, it's been interesting to look at them grow from step to step, um, try to be supportive of them in their various uh, school, um, you know, general uh, interests. Uh, I try to stay active with whether it's with the PTA or um, being able to help out. Um, and it's, it's been an interesting journey and I look forward to it. It's a, it can sometimes be a frustrating one. Um, you know, you make kids, you don't make their minds, but it all part of the partnership with between parents, schools, teachers, and the students themselves. Awesome. So you mentioned that it was, that your journey was frustrating. Well, or there are frustrating parts in the journey. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Um, well, the New York City school systems, whether in public or private, can be um, a maze to navigate. You know, you almost have to be in school yourself as a parent <laughs> to really understand, you know, there's so many different acronyms, so many different programs. And um, honestly, if you're not sometimes on top of what is happening with your child, they can be disadvantaged by a system that is supposed to be geared towards helping them. I mean, all of that is what led to me even um, running for the communication, Community Education Council, um, being involved with the PTA or the SLT, the school leadership teams, um, and just trying to maintain communication with all those who have an impact on my children's life. So when you say, um that the system is set up to disadvantage them? Did I catch um, that? It's not set up to disadvantage them, but there are a lot of cracks in the system. Okay, your child, my child can be same age, going through what should be the same um, education and depending on maybe the school they're in, the class they're in, the teacher they have, your child may be benefiting um, from support, um, being guided towards, um, you know, achieving whatever their true potentials are. 
And mine could be left at the back of the class. Mine could be overlooked. Mine could be um, picked on because he didn't look a particular way or um, speak a particular way, or maybe I wasn't in there as much as you are. So I've been trying to do that journey to make sure that I can support my kids. I can be an advocate for them because I think it's very important for you to be an advocate for your child. Um, and also just in general, supporting my other parents and friends. Some of them are as active, some of them not so much, but it takes, um, it takes a collaborative effort and it takes taking, it takes keeping your eyes and ears open and being willing to speak up when it is important for you to speak up. Um, because yeah, the system would sometimes just go ahead, um, do what's best, yes, maybe for the majority. And if you're not aware of, oh wait, my child should be able to get this. Um, look, it's summer school time right now. Um, and <laughs> even during the widely advertised summarizing program, um, we were hearing people complaining about things as simple as having water for students. I send my kids with um, water to the program every day, so it wasn't a big deal for me. But the assumption was that they're provided with full meal. So you'd assume that if you're provided with a full meal, you'll be getting water on these hot days, right? So just some things like that are handled very differently depending on the building you're in, depending on who's running your program. And also whether you know it sometimes depends on the communication that you get from the schools, from the administration, or even from your children. Right, and you seem to be like super involved, right? The fact that you even send your kids to school with water, right? As opposed to, you know, other parents, the expectation is that my school will have the food and they will provide the resources and they will provide the water and, and basic needs. And it's less of a burden for me as a parent. Um, well, I mean, if you're in the DOE system, and I've been both in DOE um, as well as in the Catholic school systems, um, and you know, basically when I was not in the DOE, there's certain things I knew whether I wanted to or not, it had to come out of my pocket. So that could also sometimes guide my decision, but it's not about one person being necessarily um, more involved or a better parent than the other. It's a matter sometimes of just knowing because I did that because that's what I always did. Um, but my assumption was that they had the choice, um, until <laughs> we got a, a note saying, okay, send it in, you know? Um, so in a case like that, if you were going off of those assumptions or you were not the, um, super nitpicky person like myself who likes to know everything about where they are, it can slip over your head. Um, and we see too many cases where. Um, sometimes it's when a child is getting ready to graduate or things of that sort that um, some issues that should have been addressed when they were like little fledgling issues are brought up. Um, I recall my son, as I said, now is in uh, high school, but there was a sixth grade incident that got me exceedingly upset, even though I was a super involved parent, where um, there was one class that um, a teacher called in and said he was not necessarily performing as um, it was on the day of, um, I guess, progress reports. Now, mind you, as in every other year, I had been involved with the school from the get-go. As a matter of fact, I spoke to the office that same day, um, you know, on different issues or whatnot, um, to the point that, you know, if I call or the school or if the school calls me, I don't have to ask who's speaking. They don't have to ask who's speaking because we recognize each other's voice. Um, and this one teacher had the audacity to tell me that my quiet son, oh, they didn't even know he was in the class until it was time for the report. That's a problem with you as a teacher and your management of the class. That's not a problem with my child because it's your responsibility to engage your children, whether they're very super talkative or quiet. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's little things like that. And I, you sometimes have to call them out on, but at the same point in time, as a parent, I try to be supportive. I try to, you know, I understand that the DOE system is a very bureaucratic system. <laughs> and the reason that they don't have certain things um, is because it's not getting to them in time. 
and it's no fault of the teachers. Most of them are going out of their pocket, trying their best. And a lot of them do want the best for our kids. And sometimes even in their, you know, even when they do the wrong thing, it's in a misguided sense of wanting to provide the best, but without taking into account that, okay, you know what, your situation and mine may be different. I'm in technology. I always have a lot of technology around. Um, so moving to remote for this pandemic was, you know, it wasn't too much of a big deal for me. I was able to kind of pre the need for devices and so forth. Um, the weekend that schools were shutting down, I hauled my kids with me and we were in Best Buy and I'm like, listen, if I'm going to be working from home and you guys are going to be working from home, we all need to have a device. I was in the position and had the know-it-all to be able to do that at that point in time. Now we see that the school year has just ended and there are some kids who may not have, who I think were still waiting on their um, devices from September. You know, so those are some of the things. It's not a matter of um, any one was bad intention, but the system is just sometimes not set up to be as efficient as it is to serve the needs of every single child. So you have to be super involved to um, advocate when those gaps are found or to find ways to work collaboratively to creatively fill them. I get the feeling that you're one of those parents that the teacher knows by, they, they know your face, they know your name. Are you one of those parents like, oh, that's Natifa, we already know. <laughs> well, I try to be. I mean, you know, I like school. And to me, the ideal for my children would be that their education experience is as pleasant, is as memorable as mine. I took a trip back to my old elementary school like two months ago, and it was, you know, interesting. I'm like, they're taking pictures with old teachers. A couple of them are still around. But the reason that I'm even willing to do that is because the foundation was set that I have pleasant memories in there. And if your experience is not, you're not going to want to go back to somewhere that, you know, was a heartache to you. Right. So you went back because of your experience. You had a positive right. experience there and you want your children to have those positive experiences yeah, as well. And, you know, and in terms of the, you know, I had a lot of supportive teachers. I mean, not everyone. And you, as a student, I, I question things. Um, I taught my, I, I do teach, um, but at the higher ed uh, level right now, um, I did teach high school for a year. Um, so, I, I, you know, I understand a little bit of both viewpoints, um, but then as a parent, I also know that I have to be my primary advocate for my children. Um, and to a greater extent when possible to their peers, because um, more often than not, whatever issue I'm having, somebody else is having. And I might be talkative and vocal about it. Somebody else might be suffering in silence. So a lot of times when we were able to bring those issues to the forefront, we we're able to get them addressed quicker and more holistically. Right. So what do you say to those parents who may say, you know, I, I can't get, I don't have as much time to get that involved. I have two jobs, you know, I'm struggling to pay rent. Like I, I you know, school is more of like a, like a, a, a passing thing, a, a secondary thing. It's not as important as say, you know, finding a job. Um, I'm gonna just say that your children are your greatest investment. So, uh, you know, to me, you work to support your family. You don't have a, a family to support your job or whatnot. So I'm not saying lose your job so that you can go on a class trip. <laughs> what I'm saying is that there is a way for every parent to be involved. What is the language barrier? Um, I know lots of parents um, who are recent immigrants and their children, um, you know, sometimes as young as five and six are the primary translators between them and the system. Um, but you have to find your niche. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask for assistance. Buddy up with other parents. There's, you know, there's someone who is often going through the same issues as you are going, whether you're in the um, 
DOE system, whether you're in Catholic system, whether you're in um, a charter system, there are means and ways. Um, you know, don't feel that, okay, you don't have enough time, so you're not going to go. At least try to come out to um, a, a parent-teacher meeting, okay? You realize maybe they're more focused on fundraising and you don't have the time for that. That's fine, but reach out to your teachers um, and, you know, make sure that if there's a mailing list that you can be on or a text list or whatever it is, make sure that you sign up for those re reminders. So even if you can't be there, you have the information. There's so many ways to be involved. Um, sometimes you work in the community, you know, one of your two or three jobs, maybe some kind of resource that your school is having. Don't just assume that, okay, you know what, listen, that's their responsibility. If you can help make that um, connection, it benefits your child and other children. So just try to find your niche. Okay, for me, I know that is a focus, like I would not feel comfortable otherwise <laughs> than, um, you know, if I could go on the trip, I'm going. If I um, can attend the meeting, I am, but that's me. I know that's not everyone. And I've had um, parent friends who sometimes like, ah, I, can't, I, I can't do that. I don't um, want to do that and say, okay, you know what? Bring the information back. And I don't mind, well, not all the time. I mean, sometimes, you know, <laughs> uh, depending on what it is, yes, you do encourage people to be um, more involved or as involved, but the whole thing is to find your niche. I am not a stay-at-home mom, so it's harder for me to volunteer during the day. So my ability to do that would be, yeah, I take a half day off or a day off when we're going on a school trip, okay? If you may be um, a parent who is able to be in the school in, in the morning um, and you have that time, fine. But we understand that, okay, if the PTA now is having some after-school event or so forth, you're not going to be there because you got to be home maybe whether it's doing dinner or taking care of little ones or whatnot. So the whole idea is that there isn't one correct way to be involved. It doesn't always have to be physical. It could just, it could be in terms of resources. It could just be in terms of, okay, you know what? Your kid is in um, kindergarten and the teacher has a million and one things that they're cutting up. You know, say, um, is there something that I can assist with? And they say, okay, you know what? Um, if I send home a folder of, these stars can you cut them out for me that's one last thing that a teacher has to take the time away to do so that they can really focus on getting to know your kids and helping get them to the next stage of, of involvement awesome awesome so uh from the bio i picked up um that you're on the grenada council and i i hear a, a west indian accent uh yes. which makes me um uh, which makes me wonder, um, you know, I, I'm assuming you're an immigrant yourself, and I'm wondering, um, do you think because you're an immigrant that there's more emphasis on education as opposed to people who are not immigrants? Um, somewhat, I, I believe. Um, I mean, and it's, it's, there's no one uh, there's no one broad brush for everyone, but for me, like I, I did migrate um, when I was uh, starting college. Yes, my dad um, is here, but my mom is still um, back in Grenada. So I am a direct immigrant, <laughs> my children are first um, generation. But yes, there, is, there was definitely an influence, um, an emphasis on staying involved with the education system there. So that does guide my part. But also, um, even as a child in school, I, I didn't know that there were a lot of resources that are available today um, to my children that were not available to me. But I had teachers who were still as dedicated. Um, and, you know, I got involved in things like, well, there we call it Girl Guides, the equivalent of like Girl Scouts here. Um, and a lot of these people were volunteers and so from them being able to give themselves so that i had great experiences i was able to travel go to camps um do different kinds of programs and it was because some of these people gave extra for them so i feel it's my turn to give back to help my children be able to have some of those experiences and you know where possible 
also bring their friends along. Right. And you, and your upbringing, I'm assuming you, you had that sense of community, like you had people to lean on and your parents had people to lean on as well to, to help you accomplish that goal. Well, we say it takes a village and um, how that village looks is different. I mean, I grew up, uh, there was a day off, no problem. And grandparents were there. Um, I do um, know that, you know, here you have to be a lot more careful. There are some crazy people out there. Um, and there's a lot of uh, opportunities that I think I was able to um, partake in that people volunteer at their times. It's sometimes harder to find here. I mean, if you have the money, you can pay for everything. I'm not rich. <laughs> um, but at the same at the same point in time, yes, I think it is important to have a network. And if you have that organic structure, maybe a large family that's um, close knit, you know, it's great, but it's not the situation for everyone. Um, so finding those parents, whether it's the same mom, you know, you're, you, you drop your kid in the morning and there's a group of you that tend to hang around, you'll be surprised at how much information that can be shared in those kind of things. Um, being able to have that kind of community uh, to organize whether it's carpooling or, you know, just keeping um, interconnected when you're going from one stage to the other. Like my daughters, as I said, just did the middle school application process and um, having gone from public to private, then um, back to public, um, I had not initially been catering for them to do that because they were in a school that went from, that went to eighth grade. Um, so that was a kind of like frustrating process. And it was interesting to talk to um, to other parents who were considering different schools, schools that may not have been on my mind. I had um, fellow parents who were on the PTA and so forth with me asking, well, where are you putting your kids? Because, and especially if like they were also um, immigrants and sometimes, you know, maybe also not, not even from an English speaking country. So in addition to um, a new process, there's also like language, um, assimilation that's going on there. And it really helped when um, someone has a resource. Uh, you know, as recently as Saturday, um, someone mentioned that their child um, went to the school that my kids are now um, planning to attend in the, in the fall. And I've put it on my calendar. Okay, you know what? I'm going to have a conversation. I'm going to try to get a sense of was in there and this was you know a random conversation at a picnic in the park so uh, you know i think the village sometimes goes beyond just uh, the people that you would necessarily have in your home or leave your kids directly with it it deals with being able to have those conversations being able to know look my child is now 10 they're going into this stage they're interested in i don't know football or gymnastics or whatever else and finding the people who can provide benefit in that not to um just be taken from them but to also be sharing what what can you share and you know with an exchange of information i think you have the best um means of making sure that you're successful as a parent because it's hard you know kids gonna back talk and it's easy when you're an adult to forget like the times that you did it as a kid, especially, you know, as you're getting closer to those teenage years. Um, and sometimes you can feel that you're in this journey alone. Um, and then when you're talking with another parent and realizing, oh, wait a minute, that happened to me last week. I thought it was me alone. And it makes you feel not necessarily good, but that empathy, you know, that ability to have someone else who is identifying with what you might be going through. Um, Etc. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And particularly, I mean, I personally find with um, uh, West Indian families, because I myself am Trinidadian, um, like we tend to kind of may have these clusters, these community clusters. 
um, like we go to the same churches and the same parks and the same events. And of course, you know, Trinidadians talk to each other and, you know, they tend to go to like the same places and the same schools and the, <laughs> the, we tend to kind of uh, stay in a little bubble. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I definitely agree with you, you know, community is, it's everything, you know, you're not in it alone. And, you know, there's always someone else that is going through what you're going through. So I, definitely, yeah. So, you know, finding, finding that outlet, you know, reaching out to other parents, you know, definitely buddying up and getting a little uh, buddy system going, you know, I think that'll definitely help you help the parent to be more involved in the school system right. or just in, in general with their child. Just in general. And besides just the buddy system, um, understanding, as I said, like what is out there, what, what your rights are, what your services are. Okay. You know what you, you notice that your child has, um, a bit of a stutter. Okay. Um, how do you try to get around to speed services? Um, you realize that because of the pandemic, um, you know, they didn't have a math teacher for six months, okay? Um, but they have, but they're expected to take the state tests, okay? Um, how can you uh, help them to get tutoring? Um, who do you talk to in the school? What, what does the guidance counselor do? Or, you know, all of these little things that, that sometimes we take for granted, granted in an um, ideal time. Um, when you're going through the issue, it's too late because you're frustrated, your head is hot. Sometimes you have like deadlines of um, the time that you need to do something. So making those connections in advance, you end up in a situation that you need to call on that network. You know exactly who to call. Um, and to me, that's like one of the most important things I could think of as a takeaway as a parent, building that network. I know we hear in lots of spaces now, things like, you know, find your tribe. Um, and you can have different tribes and your parenting tribe is just as important. So what do you think of um, the role of social media and and the the impact that social media has on building those connections? I think it's super important. I, I mean, and I'm biased. I'm I'm in technology anyway, <laughs> but um, you have to be careful with it for the children themselves. But definitely as a parent, I think there's so much value. Like for me, um, I think even being able to connect with you, I connected through social media. Um, and one of the things, one of the the most um, the greatest groups that I found during the pandemic was the Black Resource Network. Because as much as I have been in Queens for the past 15 years, I work in Manhattan. Um, prior to that, I had lived in Brooklyn. Um, I emigrated from Grenada. So there was a lot of my network and connections that were not necessarily where I lived because I left early in the morning and I got home late in the evening. As my children started, you know, going to school and getting involved in extracurricular activities, um, I started, yes, to have some connections in there. But definitely in this year, I think I've probably made more <laughs> than in the last decade. Um, and a lot of that was through things that I saw, events on social media, being part of groups, um, joining and having those conversations, finding people who shared my um, interests in certain things, um, finding people who did not share my interests in certain things and, you know, being able to guide yourself in that way. And I think it was also like a good way to help people um, be able to vent when needed without, you know, without sometimes having to physically engage. Um, I think it benefited the parents a lot more than the kids. Um, and that's why, you know, it was good. Like some of them started playing their little own social games. So, you know, they were playing Among Us and all these different things. But um, traditional social media, the Facebooks and the Twitters and the Instagrams and um, even more professionally like LinkedIn, uh, I think they're invaluable at this point in time. Uh, this last year, would have been a thousand times less manageable without them. Awesome. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, I know you said you're a little biased, but would you encourage, let's say, your grandparents, for example, to get on social media? Um, kind of connect with yes. people their age? Yeah, I, I would. And, you know, even so, uh, in this year, you saw like a lot of um, pair, people not able to connect with, yes, grandparents um, that would normally see their, see their grandkids or so forth over time, people who would travel, those who were in different countries. And social media allowed them to somewhat stay engaged um, with the process. Um, and I don't think there's a one answer for anything. I, I think you have to find your speed, find where you are. Um, as the as the different platforms have come up, you tend to find younger, you know, the teens and so forth navigating more to Instagram and younger um, programs, the Snapchat, etc. Whereas um, a lot of older people have stayed with like the Facebook, you know, those who came off of the like MySpace age and and things like that. And then you see. Um, depending on the platforms that you have, uh, the grandparents who are doing all the different types of video chatting, whether it's, whether, you know, it's on their iPads, on their, um, their uh, other devices. And I think it's, it's great because it takes away a little bit of sometimes the loneliness and the separation that, um, we were forced into. Um, and it, it gives, it gives grandparents a little bit of a new lease on life. And, um, also like kids who don't get to see them that often, they get to know, um, these people that they may hear of or speak once in a while on the phone. Now you can actually see and interact. You can, um, model that new dress for them. You can, um, have them be a part of your graduation ceremonies and, and all these different things. So I think it's a wonderful thing. Does it need to be used in balance? Of course. Um, but yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So going back to what you said earlier, you said you have high, uh, your oldest is in high school and your two youngest is in middle school. Do you find that there's a difference between the different stages of school, like, like with elementary, middle and high school? Well, they're entering middle school, so they have not started their middle school um, oh, right. journey yet. For the younger ones, they will be in middle school. They will be in sixth grade in um, in uh, September. The my son, he started high school during the pandemic, unfortunately. So I was a little bit concerned about you know you know high school is kind of a very transitional stage, and um, I. His school was great in terms of trying to engage them, but um, I don't think it, they got the same experience that most of us did traditionally being on campus for the first time. So um, to me, September would be another restart of, <laughs> of high school. Um, so I'm quite interested to see how that whole process will um, go through. But yeah, there, there's definitely a different um, difference in the stages. Um, in elementary, you, you know, kids tend to be a lot more dependent on their parents, a lot more engaged with them, a lot more open to them being on those um, trips. Let's say I have twins, so school trips were interesting if they weren't in the same class because then there was sometimes a little bit of a fight. Oh, I want you to come and I want you to be on my bus if we're going to be on a different bus, y you know. Um, as they get into that middle to high school stage, it's kind of like, oh gosh, she's going to come and embarrass me um, <laughs> kind of stage. But I think as parents, we have to be even more more um, involved at that stage. Not not to baby them, but to, to be open and willing to support in whatever way we can. Um, because that's when sometimes we think, oh, they got it. But they're going through so many like frustrating changes um, between um, adolescence and everything else, peer pressures and whatnot, that that's the quickest point to lose them, you know. Um, so I, I think you do have to be engaged, but the engagement may be sometimes a little bit different. You need to part notes sometimes with the teacher if they're not staying on track, if they're not doing whatever, not to do work for them, not to do... Um, you know, not to be hovering over them, but to kind of help understand what might be their struggles and how you can like help support them at that point in time. So it moves from that happy, everyone is just happy to be together elementary stage to a bit more detached, but at the same time, 
um, involved a role as they get older. I'm still learning. I'm, I'm not going to quote be, I'm not going to claim to be, you know, an expert, but um, that's what I've um, noticed. Like I, I've seen so many changes in my son in the last, say, two, three years, which would be that middle into high school period where, um, you know, you, you no longer can just you know, kind of sign them up for things that you're interested in, that you think they will benefit from. Their all their personalities have um, shown how they they are cleaving to certain things more than the other. You, they have their own friends. It's not you know the people that you may have organized a play date with, and um, sometimes it's hard as a parent to let go. Um, and it's I think it's a struggle that continues but you have to get used to it. And the fact that each child is different. So I'm wondering now if the schools that you sent them to tend to be in the same district or did you send oh. them to different, <laughs> to different districts? Um, so one thing that I wanted my son to do when he was looking for high school choices um, was to look for schools that had programs that he would like that he would be interested in. Um, and I wanted him to think a little less about distance and more about suitability. Um, because you know what, right now they're in two different districts. My daughters are in district 28, which is where I'm running for the council. Um, my son is in district 26. It takes about a half an hour drive or an hour if he takes a bus by himself to get to school. But that was a program that he got um, assigned to and we decided to accept. There were some others that were closer, um, but I felt comfortable with the, the way they were um, supporting during the pandemic. So <laughs> it worked out. Um, I also, because you also have to know your kids. My, my son is a little bit more introverted, definitely not as talkative as me. My daughters, they're in the middle. They're, they're a little bit more um, talkative. and. Um, what fits for each child is going to be different. Okay. He wasn't as much into the sports. He did music. He did, um, he's into the technology. He's into those kind of things. So places that had programs for that, that's how we, we, um, we kind of chose it. So I had on there, if you wanted to go to the school in Manhattan, we'll work at it. The only ones that I was like, re didn't really kind of help push him to was the Bronx. That commute is going to be a little bit long, you know, based on where we live. Um, but it was open to some places that weren't too far in Brooklyn, that were in Queens, that were in whatever it is, as long as the program fits your kid. Um, similarly with my daughters for middle school, the, the list of schools that they had on their application were also um, mixed. Some of them were 10 minutes um, away, others closer to an hour. Um, and I felt that it was important that they didn't feel that they were forced to go to a program just because it's close. Because I think the worst thing you can sometimes do is like kill someone's um, interest just out of convenience. And you're going to have enough of that when you're an adult and you're responsible for your own bills and stuff. So at this point in time, um, the, way, the best that you can support their dreams is better. Right. So, and, it, and you're willing to make that sacrifice for your kids right. so if that means you have to you know travel for an hour you know to get to them you're willing to do that right um but at the same point in time again just as in terms of the level of involvement i know that's something that i was prepared to do okay um but this is another reason that i think we have to make sure that we have as many programs as possible that fits the the needs of diverse kids right in the area Okay, so um, I was quite surprised when my son was in um, it, going into kindergarten and um, got into a gifted and talented program. We're living in South Jamaica and he gets assigned to a program over in Forest Hills. I like Forest Hills, we went over there, but it was in my neighborhood. Um, the commute was a pain. I got my car towed a couple of times, <laughs> dropping him and with my talkative self getting caught up before the police um, comes and tickets it. Um, but a bigger issue to me was, okay, 
why don't we have the program that he got in over there, over here? So while I'm willing to get them into what program they have, I'm also just as in, interested in making sure that those programs are here. So ideally, yeah, if they wanna be in this program and there's one right here, they're recommended. In the event that it's not, in the meantime, fine, go wherever you are. But that's part of my, um, I guess, my advocacy. Okay, um, you know, I think that in New York City uh, school system is huge and there's opportunities for everyone but not everyone has the same access and um a big uh, a big um interest of mine is getting some of the access in these harder to reach places and unfortunately salty Queens, where i see a lot more people who look like me um is one of those places that yes has pockets of opportunity but not in the same set of clusters as happens in certain other parts of you know, and I'm talking specifically as it comes to education, it's been Queens. I mean, I've lived out of Queens, but as far as my kids have come, it's been around Queens. So from that perspective, I think it's really unevenly distributed. And those are some of the things that I hope to advocate for, like even in my other roles. Right. And you bring up a, a very good point that it's to get certain programs, you have to go away sometimes or like it's not close to you like you have to go somewhere else to get it and what does that say about the availability of programs in particular areas that you right. have to you know it, it, yeah it says that it's not evenly distributed it's not equitably distributed um and um you have to do what's right for your child but i think there's a bigger thing because you know what what's right for my child may not be what's right for yours um and just because i got an easy out for mine um, doesn't mean I shouldn't fight to make sure that everything is, is is available, that they have options. I think we should always have options in like I like, I, I love options, you know? So if you ask me for chocolate and vanilla ice cream, I want to know why can't I have both? Um, and I think that's how our education system needs to be, that every child, um, to, to quote, um, one of the ladies that I met through the group um, a lot of times, she talks about everyone, every child is brilliant. I, I might be misquoting it a bit, but how do we support that brilliance? Okay, how do we help them to uncover what is um, their passions? How do we help facilitate them moving from one stage to the other? Um, and only as we get the resources there that they can explore, that they can try new things that they can um, figure out, you know what, I really wanted to be this, but when I see what's involved, I don't like it anymore. That they can do that when they're six and seven and eight and 13, so that they're not doing it at 25 and then become so invested in it that they, they're forced to be stuck in like some something that they really don't like. That's to me what your education system should be um, helping you to do. Find out who you are, what you want, and provide a path for you to get to it. Absolutely, absolutely. So if you could change one, one thing about the education system, what would you change? Oh boy, only one? <laughs> um, if I could change one thing about the education system, um, it would be that access, as I said, to resources in terms of making it more equitable okay you should be like each child should receive the differentiated um uh education that they need to support their particular um their, their particular sets of skills so you know to me we have to go through hoops to get um tested for certain things and evaluated, whether it is for a gifted and talented class or for um, special support services or to or, or to be able to um, be placed in a um, enrichment program or a music program or so forth. I think the one thing would be to provide that from the time you set your foot in school, whether you're three or so forth, that you have like this assigned person that is eva evaluating that 
every year to make sure that your needs are being met going forward and that it shouldn't be dependent on oh i have a super involved parent or i happen to have a, par a teacher who has taken um special interest in me to make sure that i'm maximizing my potential awesome awesome all right so we are just coming up to the end here so do you have what advice do you have for the parents watching you right now what advice do you have for them um parenting is not easy none of us are perfect um but as far as your children's education goes stay involved get involved how that involvement looks is going to be unique to you and your child if you have a very independent child they may actually want you to back off on certain things if you have one who needs a lot more support they may need you to be there um you know do not dismiss the ptas and so forth they're not just for fundraising or um little cliques they are to help support and partner with your school with your district to ensure that your child and every other child has the opportunities that um are needed they do you know your school leadership teams and whatever whatever other types of um organizations if you're in a non-public school they may be called different um things homeschool associations whatever else all of these um provide you sometimes with access to the people who have the policy making for your children and if your voice is not heard to make sure that they're making the right policies for your kids they're going to be disadvantaged so stay involved get involved stay involved um find your niche and stick with it awesome 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 all right nathifa thank you so much for uh this amazing conversation it was definitely very enlightening and i hope it was enlightening to our viewers so if you are a DOE parent, sign up for the mailing list and attend the meetings of your respective community education councils. You can also sign up for the council in District 28 at www.cecd28.org slash contact. All this contact information will be provided in the description. And if you happen to be in the New York City area, uh, particularly in Queens, and uh, you're, you're an avid Facebook user or Instagram user, uh, check out the Black Resource Network and its subgroup. So let's pay attention to the spelling of Black. It's B-L-A-Q-U-E. It's a blend of Black and Queens. It's actually pretty cute. Uh, so the, the Black Resource Network is well over 15,000 members, and it's focused on connecting its members with education, career, and wealth building resources through connecting and sharing. I will also provide the link to that as well in the description. So thank you so much for joining us today. Please check out our YouTube channel for more videos and clips, and don't forget to subscribe. Please tune in next time to our next episode. Thank you so much for joining us. And we are signing off. Thank you Thank for coming. Bye-bye.